This video is brought to you in part by Squarespace. More on them in just a bit. In 1991, while developing what would eventually become Pokemon, Game Freak released Smart Ball, one of the very first Super Nintendo games to hit store shelves. That might sound pretty mundane, I know, until you find out that this wasn't just some second team side project. Some of the most formative names in Pokemon's history, such as series creator Satoshi Tajiri or artist Ken Sugimori, were directly involved in the inspiration and creation of Smart Ball. Oh, and also, this Nintendo game was funded and published by Sony. That might still sound reasonable to you, given that Nintendo and Sony had entered an agreement in 1988 to produce a CD expansion for the SNES called the Nintendo PlayStation. However, Nintendo famously pulled out of that deal the day after Sony revealed the system to the world, instead partnering with Philips on a different ill-fated SNES add-on, humiliating and infuriating the Sony executives previously uninterested in moving into the world of gaming, and leading to THE Spite Store to close all Spite Stores. That all happened in June of 1991. This Game Freak Sony Nintendo collaboration would hit Japanese shelves three months after that. And better yet, Sony greenlit a sequel despite the bad blood with Nintendo. That sequel was nearly finished and released before Sony cancelled it at the final hour in 1994 due to the PlayStation's imminent launch. Within just a few years of this unlikely collaboration, the PlayStation was well on its way to being the most successful console to date. Game Freak and Nintendo were on top of the world, having created what would quickly become the single biggest media franchise in history, and Game Freak made a PS1 exclusive game that's half Pokemon, half Trauma Center. Wait, what? Okay, so to take it back here, Game Freak was originally founded in 1983 as a gaming magazine, a sort of hobby project that quickly found success. By the end of the decade, creator Satoshi Tajiri felt that his team was capable of parlaying that industry experience into proper game production, sort of like how every YouTuber finds a way to release a music album at some point, see you in 2025. Speaking of music, Tajiri happened to have a connection to the music industry, having worked in some sort of freelance capacity for Sony Records, also known as Epic records around the time that the Super Nintendo was entering production. These two distinct roads in Tajiri's life happened to intersect at a perfect moment. See, not only had Sony and Nintendo partnered up on this Nintendo PlayStation idea, Sony was the company that was producing the Super Famicom sound chips, and the company explored the possibility of designing games to showcase that hardware's capabilities. And wouldn't you know it, one of their freelancers had just started developing video games. The original idea for this Game Freak Sony game, funnily enough, came around the same time and had probably the same inspiration as Pokemon, which is, of course, Dragon Quest. See, Smart Ball was a pet idea of one of the Epic Records employees, of an RPG where you would play as a lowly slime enemy, which the team at Game Freak thought would be pretty funny. Pokemon famously began as a similar pet idea, while Tajiri and artist Ken Sugimori were playing Dragon Quest II in their spare time. The former was grinding an annoying enemy fight to try and get its rare item drop, while the latter was sitting there with an extra one in his inventory that both wished they could just trade from one copy to another. In fact, Pokemon and Smart Ball's productions might intertwine a bit more than you would think, with both starting production around 1990, with staff members splitting time on both games, and of course, with every Game Freak project between Pokemon's green lighting and its 1996 release essentially just kind of being a way to keep the lights on while that game slowly trucked along. One of the earliest pieces of Pokemon concept art even highlights this overlap, showing the Pokemon trade station featuring a Sony TV monitor. Just kind of neat, don't you think? Now, although Smart Ball began its life as an RPG, it quickly transformed into more of an action title after concerns arose that an RPG really wasn't gonna use the slime gimmick pretty much at all, actually. Early ideas were wildly ambitious, as tends to happen the first couple times when non-developers are diving into the world of game development. Sugimori drew hundreds of different concepts out, showcasing the little slime heroes stretching across gaps like a bridge, splitting into multiple smaller slimes that could be controlled by the player, etc. In their ambition, the team at Game Freak ended up designing so many little one-off enemies and jokes that people really wouldn't get, and continuing to add more and more to the game ended up cutting into the time where more experienced teams would have started balancing their game better. 
Thankfully, in this case, this ambition resulted in a game that's unbalanced in a way that makes it too easy instead of way too hard. So, silver linings to those growing pains, I suppose. By the time Smartball released in September of 1991, as one of the first 30 or so Super Nintendo games ever, it was a fully-fledged platformer where you played as a kid that was turned into a jelly bean by an evil wizard. For this reason, the game's actually called Jelly Boy in Japan, not to be confused with the game we got here several years later that's also called Jelly Boy. The Japanese version of Jelly Boy slash Smartball actually had a full story and towns full of villagers to talk to and everything, but all of this was cut from the international release for some reason. In Japan, Game Freak even touched its magazine roots and released a little comic to promote the game and its story, and this comic really showcases that Ken Sugimori connection. Like, this character here, that's just, that's just Ash. That is just straight up an early version of Ash. But again, all of that story just isn't present in the international release. Instead, according to the manual, our protagonist, Prince <sighs> Jerry, is turned into a slime because his brother, and I'm not kidding here, Tom, is jealous of Jerry's wife being hot. So Tom hires an evil wizard, and there's, there's your plot. His name is Jerry, by the way, not because of the Tom and Jerry joke there, although I'm sure that's why Tom's name is that, but instead because Smartball does the thing where you collect letters in every stage, those letters spelling out Jerry rather than Jelly thanks to the L and R thing, where Japan doesn't have an exact one-to-one -one analog for either English letter or sound, instead having more of a sound that, at least as far as I understand it, is best described as in the middle of our two letters. So, in fact, the game is known as Jerry Boy in Japan, so rather than change that, the kid's name is Jerry in the international release. Collecting all five Jerry letters only gives you two extra lives, by the way, so there's not really a reason to go out of your way to get them. So beyond that, how does Smart Ball play? Well, we've got 16 stages here split across eight worlds, and although most of the game is exceptionally easy, it finds equal time to impress you with some really neat level design and annoy you when that level design doesn't sometimes quite really work. Game Freak did a frankly stellar job of utilizing that slime protagonist gimmick, with the Y button allowing you to cling and travel across walls and ceilings. Having this extra layer to every platform you touch leads to some wider or taller levels than you'd probably expect this early in the Super Nintendo's lifespan, and it makes for some really fun opportunities for hidden secrets such as heart pieces to upgrade your health, extra lives, the Jerry letters which again just give you more extra lives anyway, power-ups, the works. The problem is, those power-ups don't matter? Getting a game over just resets your score, but you can start right from the same level. Your extra hearts disappear once you finish the level you're in, essentially nothing carries over from level to level besides your score, which, as far as I could tell, isn't saved anywhere once you turn the game off anyway. I liked finding the Jerry letters because it showed the game's creative potential, but at a certain point, I just played to finish the game because the reward of two measly lives was rarely worth even the limited risk in such an easy game. And also because the game is easy enough that it's just daring you to cheese through it anyway. Your main form of attack in Smart Ball are these little balls, uh, what a surprise, that you collect throughout the levels, which you can shoot at enemies by pressing L. You can even grab a ball after shooting it at an enemy to regain it, which turns the boss fights into a sort of a tennis match you're playing with yourself because you don't have any friends. Any of the game's other power-ups replace this ball ability, however, so even this is limited. There's a heavier ball that does a little bit more damage, a higher jump that you can only perform when you're holding that jump ball. Every now and then you'll find a seed that you can shoot at to create a climbable vine, just be careful not to hit enemies with any of these, or else you might lose the power-up. Again, really neat kind of risk-reward idea there, it's just that most of the time you're killing even the strongest of bosses in five or so hits anyway, so you can just keep shooting balls at him and win before you take a single hit. I'm not joking here, the biggest moments of risk-reward in Smart Ball are when you have to shoot a power-up straight into the air and hope you can grab it right after because you can't even pick up health if you have a power-up on you, so you have to shoot the power-up away to get health. Also, you can only have 9 balls on you at any given point. The moment you collect a 10th, it just resets and restores your health, and you lose access to the best attack option in the game until you find more balls. If you don't by chance have any spare balls on you at any given point though, don't worry because our Jelly Boy here can... he can... he can stretch. Yeah, his other attack option is just holding up to stretch out, making yourself a hitbox and also giving you decent odds to take damage while in the act of stretching. 
Now, despite how lukewarm I might sound overall about Smart Ball, I actually do really like what the game tries to do. It's got a charm factor to it that leads me to say that it's worth giving the game at least a small look. It's only an hour and a half long at best anyway, so small is about as good as you're gonna get. It's got a bump in soundtrack, so it did achieve what Sony Records sought out to do by highlighting the SNES hardware. And as easy as it might be, the level design is usually unique and neat enough that, again, it's a cool little oddity. Plus, it's the first in a surprising amount of jelly or blob-based platformers on the SNES. It's, it's kind of weird that it happened as many times as it did. What's weirder is that Sony ever greenlit a Jelly Boy 2 at all, or more so that the game got as far along in production as it did despite the rapid breakdown in the Nintendo PlayStation agreement in the months before Jelly Boy 1 even dropped. But... they did, and a near-complete build of the game at some point leaked online. And it's good. Like, it's actually really, really good. I'm not gonna sit here and call it one of the best platformers on the Super Nintendo, but I definitely wouldn't knock you if you did. You could definitely make an argument that this is the sleeper hit to end all Super Nintendo sleeper hits. Jelly Boy 2 features six playable characters, each with their own unique abilities, a Mega man style level select structure, 40 total levels across this whole theme park, permanent health upgrades, which might just be the most shocking part of this sentence, and an odd fixation on clown enemies. Although you start with just the same Jelly Boy as before, as you beat the first five of this game's eight total worlds, you'll unlock a character who shoots a little boomerang instead of a ball, a fat kid with a dash attack, a nerd who can set bombs instead of balls, a dog slime with a hover ability, and a girl who's... she's supposed to be better at swimming, but that's essentially the only part of this game that wasn't finished by the time the game is canned, so she swims at the same speed as everybody else, and essentially, she's the only useless character outside of one secret that requires her other ability to obtain, where she can just phase through some platforms. Jelly Boy 2 tightens up nearly every spot where the first game fell short. Gone are the collectible balls or jerry letters, instead replaced by jelly beans that'll give you an extra life at every 100. This means our little blue guy here just has his ball throwing ability at all times, which is necessary because this game throws both more enemies and more difficult ones at you. They're still not hard, the game's generally on the easier side, and checkpoints are frequent enough that you're never gonna be really begging for one, but you're much more likely to land a game over here or die a few times in a row if you're not careful. In general, this game's amusement park vibe is stellar. I really love how each world progresses through its five levels, hearing some of the audio tracks develop, seeing the level theming change a bit, like when the Ninja Western area starts shifting from one of those two motifs to the other, with enemies changing around to match. The game just has that vibe that shows it was clearly a lot of fun to make, and you can feel the fun they were having while you're playing it. Like, there's a whole world in this game called Gimmick Woods that lives up to its name. It's just a bunch of different gimmicky level ideas, like mazes to mess with you. It's never painful, it doesn't overstay its welcome, it's just poking in good fun. Now, some songs in this game's soundtrack definitely feel like placeholders, a couple of them do end up feeling a little bit painful, but thankfully those levels are usually short, and they're not the ones you would ever need to replay. See, in Jelly Boy 2, the true ending is locked until you collect all nine of these puzzle tiles spread across the game. Just like with the eight heart pieces spread across the different levels, there's no indicator telling you what levels they're in. In the case of these puzzle pieces, there's usually a visible door somewhere that you can't quite reach with your current cast of characters, but not always. Some definitely are hidden pretty deviously. I found most of them on my own, I want to say seven or so of the nine, and it was actually really fun replaying early levels with some of the new characters and realizing, oh, I've got to air dash across this gap to get to that door, or, oh, if I air dash through these blocks, I can break them and get to that one, or, actually, yeah, the fat kid with the dash is kind of just the best character. Most of this game's secrets are stuff his ability can solve. We'll chalk that up to the game getting canned early. Like its predecessor, Jelly Boy 2 is not a perfect game by any stretch. The slime gimmick, for example, doesn't quite stick well, pardon the pun, with auto-scrolling levels, because you'll end up getting stuck to walls and killed by the edge of the screen creeping towards you. At the same time, I kind of wish the movement controls on the ground were just a little bit tighter, as the floor controls are a bit on the slippery side compared to the sticky wall movement, and I I'm not gonna lie, I'd overcorrect and leap right into pits more than I would usually like to admit. Some levels just actually play themselves, which is more kind of funny than anything, and again, a lot of clowns. I I'm not- I'm not afraid of clowns or anything, it's just... 
just there's a surprising number of clowns. This game was slated for a 1994 release like I said earlier, but thanks to the PlayStation's imminent launch, Sony decided against releasing a game for its now direct competitor. So, Jelly Boy 2 was dropped, only to resurface years later thanks to a mysteriously dumped ROM. Some folks even went through the trouble of translating all the text into English, although you can more than easily play the entire game in Japanese without really missing a beat. Just like with the first game, it's only a couple hours long, but while I recommend Smart Ball as a little oddity worth checking out if you're bored one day, I think you should actively seek out Jelly Boy 2 because it's an exceptional little game that deserves far better than to be left forgotten. Now before we talk about the final Sony published Game Freak game, I can't forget to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Partly because they're paying me not to forget, but also because my actual website uses Squarespace. I've done actual web design work in the past, and when it came time to do it for my own stupid YouTube brand, I just kept putting it off because it was too much work. So when Squarespace reached out, and this is all true, they're not paying me to tell you about how the sausage was made here, I looked into using them for my own stuff before I would start letting them, well, pay me. Within half an hour of fiddling around, I had a site that would have taken me far more time to make on my own, and a site that was easy to pop back into and update, tweak stuff around. I ran into an issue when trying to set my newest video to auto-update on my site's homepage, because YouTube's API is finicky with how it lets you do that sort of stuff, and I was able to get help in a couple minutes. And there's so much utility to Squarespace's other features, whether it's easy to set up email campaigns, custom member-only areas, detailed analytics, if you're looking to open a storefront, or create a site for your own hobby or brand or podcast or whatever it might be, Squarespace is a perfect all-in-one platform that'll make the work easy for you. If that's up your alley, make sure to check out squarespace.com slash goldenbolt to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to the folks at Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, and now let's jump back to it. So this is where you'd probably assume Game Freak and Sony would take separate roads and paths through the game industry. By the time Jelly Boy 2 dropped, Pokemon was only a year and change away from its early 1996 launch, and Sony was about to become the face of console gaming. Which is what makes this next game so wild. This is Click Medic, a 1999 PlayStation exclusive sort of visual novel published once again by Sony Records rather than Sony Computer Entertainment, and developed by a post-Pokemon Game Freak post-Pokemon Yellow, for the record. Obviously, Game Freak is an independent company, they're free to develop for whomever they please, but a year removed from creating a multi-billion dollar international phenomenon, this is probably the last thing you would think would be in store. Or you'd perhaps think that this was a secondary team sort of project, rather than featuring active involvement from folks like Tajiri or Sugimori, but once again, Game Freak didn't quite work like that. This, more than either of the other two Game Freak Sony projects, has clear Pokemon DNA in it, thanks in part to some very similar melodies in the soundtrack, but more so due to Sugimori's trademark art style. That doctor is just Professor Oak, this is just Nurse Joy in a wig, and that is absolutely misty. The whole game may as well be an alternate universe where instead of there being roaming creatures that you train to fight, there's a pandemic. Yeah, so in Click Medic, the world has been ravaged by this mysterious disease that can take multiple different forms in the body, and after decades, a cure has finally been discovered in 2016. That cure is a string of antibodies codenamed VB, and the only way to administer VB is for the doctor to shrink down and enter the patient's body, Magic School Bus style, inside this little ship, to explore the inside of the patient's body by way of really bad text menus, and to find and attack the source of the infection with these VB antibodies. Oh, and also, the VB are essentially just really crappy beta Pokémon designs. Each week in-game, our protagonist will have to talk to each patient to figure out the type of infection they're dealing with, and to figure out where inside the patient's body you should start looking. It's an idea that's really, really neat on paper, until it just doesn't materialize into a remotely competent video game. Now, Click Medic never released outside of Japan, so you'd think that such a very clearly wordy game would be impossible to navigate without a really competent translation doing some legwork. No such translation exists, because I'm pretty sure most people don't know this game exists, but I did mess around with some machine translation software to give me a somewhat navigable Japanese to English translation in real time, and when that failed, I used my phone and Google Translate, which naturally didn't give me the most cogent sentences, but gave me more than a serviceable alternative. That all worked because the game, at least as far as I was able to play, 
never really goes past the surface level. If somebody says their stomach was aching, you're supposed to assume that it's the type of infection that affects the stomach, and you'll inject the patient with the correct rock, paper, scissors of serum to give yourself some more time and keep the patient healthy. Most patients only say a couple sentences before you're left to your medical prowess to cure them, and even once you shrink down and enter the patient's body, the sometimes comically long explanations of bodily functions are actually straightforward when translated. The problem is that navigating through the human body by way of a choose-your-own-adventure book is about as pleasant as that sounds. You always start by the injection site in the neck, and then if you want to get to the stomach, for example, you'd have to work your way through text descriptions of the trachea, lower trachea, upper stomach, middle stomach, etc. until you start seeing these particle effects on the foreground of your screen. Even then, those particle effects are just an idea that you're kind of going in the right direction, maybe. Each stop along the way is a long description of what that part of the body does, usually with one to three highlighted words telling you where you can go next. As the game tells you right at the start of these sections, and then never again during the exploration part, certain highlighted colors have different meanings. Dark blue, for example, means that it's a one-way path to wherever you're going, so if you choose wrong, you've got to find a way to navigate all the way back to where you've started. All the while, you've got to keep an eye on your fuel levels as well as the patient's health. Entering certain areas can spike or dip their blood pressure or heart rate, although, at least in my experience, this was more of a scripted thing for tension's sake as far as I could tell. Once you do find the infection, it's battle time, as you send out up to four of your Pokémon antibodies and then sort of move them around as they send out minions in this war of attrition. I actually anticipated some sort of Pokemon-esque battle system when I first discovered this game and based on what I'd read about it, so when this was the combat in reality, I, I just kind of sat there slack-jawed for a second. Every VB has its own effect and strategy, at least nominally, and they're supposed to level up and evolve just as you're supposed to level up as a doctor, yes, that's the real phrasing, and unlock some other pathways through the veins or organs, etc. But I can't say I was able to trudge through enough of this game to find much strategy besides click through the body until you see these particle effects in the background, then roam around for a while until you find the infection, then send out your creatures and do nothing while they win. Now, I'm sure later on some patients will have multiple infections that'll take multiple consecutive days to die diagnose, and then treat, which means more text, and more importantly, more days of seeing this awesome FMV cutscene. I just, I really like that cutscene. And also, there's definitely some attempt at replayability here in Clickmatic by way of the grades you'll receive from your fellow doctors when you're done with each patient, because that's how doctoring works, I guess. Such little info about this game is out there, though, that I can't say for sure which parts of my critiques are on or off base across the entire game. Someday I'd like to go through the entire game in full with the translation software that ideally doesn't crap out on me partway through the game, because I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what Click Medic is trying to do. But in the same breath, I don't think it's going to get much better than the couple hours that I put into it because it's still insanely limited by the text navigation on the Osmosis Jones part of the game. It's such an odd system. Like, it certainly fits the name Click Medic, don't get me wrong, but if you were able to select regions in the body at which to start, rather than having to start at the same injection site in the neck, it would save so much retreading and headaches on subsequent days. And that's not to mention that all of this text sort of does a disservice to the pre-rendered 3D clips of the inside of the patient's body as you're moving through the different organs or tissues or arteries or whatever it might be. It's a bit of a waste to have gone through all of that trouble designing these cool-looking CG background scenes only to cover it with constant, overwhelming text that's just saying more than it needs to. Now again, I'm giving the game credit here, obviously I don't know for sure that the game would have been significantly easier to navigate with better translations, but based on how even the first few patients give you symptoms as a red herring, and how the infection is actually slightly further away from wherever they say was feeling funny, I'm gonna go out on a limb for now and say that the game's probably not very good regardless. There's very little room for you to engage with the patients beyond them being flesh bags you're supposed to cure. The most character I got out of anybody was after saving a little kid when she sent me a letter saying how excited she was to be able to play outside with friends again, but that's it. Click Medic even struggles to hit the most basic visual novel beats. A good translation can't exactly save a subpar gameplay loop, and that's just what this feels like, at least based on my current judgment. But let's be real, none of us were going to play or talk about this game for the sake of a competent game, it's just another one of those really fascinating oddities that I thought was worth highlighting in my recent string of, hey, here's some shit I found videos. 
It's just one of those random PS1 games that would be worth poking at as a curiosity even without the Game Freak connection, and that in turn means that nobody's really going to play it as a game, just kind of as a piece of history. If you want more of this Here's Some Shit I Found series, I made a 30 minute video about video games that run on multiple discs, and a separate video about how Dig Dug is canonically a divorced deadbeat dad. I promise those are both somehow more interesting than they sound, so I, I don't know, go watch one of those, or, or don't, if you don't I didn't want you here anyway. So, uh, bye. As always, I want to give a special thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters who make videos this stupid possible, including Goldstorm07, Cloudy Boy, Jump Rock, Karigane564, Malkavio, Mason Hunt, Philly D360, Phyrexian Sleeper Agent, Rodney220, The FOE3, The Critic of Innocence, Vincent, Arlen B, Captain Squid, Chef Kilo, Damien W, Eclipse2025, Elliot Krantz, Epo90, Even Luck, Faisal B, Firestorm422, Harry, Heidi, Hotzi, I Pay My Cam Girl, So Why Not You, Ibithon, James Boss, Justin Gregoire, Lockwee, famous Twitch streamer J Tart, not, I almost forgot about him, he's not on my list, but he's there, he's so f***ing famous, La Paradox HD, Lupine Pariah, Maxi89C, The Milkman, Patrick, Chato Nexa, Smoothies, Stefan, Terminally Nerdy, Wayne is Boss, WDog999, William Bundy, and Buckles, Chucklo. Their support means more than you might know, and if you want to join this list and get some awesome perks such as access to the Golden Bolt Discord server, early and ad-free videos, all that fun stuff, visit patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.